Hi guys, welcome back to the Confused Millennial Podcast. I'm Rachel, your host and the blogger behind theconfusedmillennial.com. And this is episode 23. And if you're new to this podcast, it's all about helping you embrace more of who you are while navigating this whole adulting thing. And today we are getting into some real adultingness. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I'm E, oh, the yeah. sometimes always co-host. <laughs> Also play the role of husband. <laughs> and soon to be... Father. <laughs> That's right. We're pregnant. So that is our super serious adultingness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Taking it to a whole new level of adulting. It's so weird still. I wonder if anyone else feels like that. Oh. I'm sure people do. Yeah, I mean, we wanted to hop on. We wanted to break down our find. Well, first of all, we're going to talk about today. Were we trying finding out we were pregnant? The process and journey of all of that so far. Maybe some of the fears and all that fun stuff, and just like keeping it real. Because I think so often you just see like the really pretty Instagram photo where it's like, oh my god, we're pregnant, and it's like, oh wow, that's super exciting. But like. When I found out that, I mean, I was, I was excited, but my tears were not tears of excitement, which we'll talk more about later on in this episode. Absolutely. So yeah. So first of all, were we trying, Eric? We weren't (laughs) not trying, Rachel. (laughs) (laughs) That's news to me. No, seriously. I mean, Eric, we went on our honeymoon like a year after we got married. So all of a sudden we're sitting at this restaurant in Hawaii and out of the blue for the early bird special. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon. We're having dinner. Eric's like, so when are you going to go off birth control? And I was like, I I think I started crying. Yeah, you freaked out. (laughs) You totally freaked out. But but for me, I was in the weird different place in my evolution at that point i thought that i had to have a baby yeah or i had to be the father of a baby yeah because i wouldn't be actually having the baby you'd be having the baby that's how anatomy works yes so (laughs) for those of you who aren't sure who gets pregnant it's the woman yeah Um, i mean eric's 34 most of his kids already have two kids or most of his kids most of my kids (laughs) most of his friends as far as i know there's no other kids especially of the age of having kids out in the world (laughs) most of his friends already have two kids and we over here with Nunca. Nunca nil zilch. I thought that I was supposed to have a child by, you know, at least the first one by 35 and the second one by 40. And I was supposed to be on this, you know. No, I'm going to challenge you on that because I really think that you thought by 33 that you would be, well, I would be, your wife would be pregnant with their first at a certain point. Yeah. Um, And I mean, I'm younger than all of his friends' wives. I, uh, at the time, I mean, was 28. I just turned 29. Um, and so that wasn't necessarily, I mean, I was focused on my career. I am focused on my career. And so when he asked me that in October, and it was like, or it was it was September, like when you got birth control, I started crying. And I was like, I don't know. I freaked out. I pretty much like didn't really have a conversation. I kind of shut down. I mean, we had a conversation, but it was just, it felt very incomplete. Yes. Um, so we get back from Hawaii. I go off birth control and I don't even tell Eric. <laughs> I think I wrote a blog post about going off birth control and didn't tell Eric. And like a couple months later, he's like, so are you still taking birth control? I was like, oh no, I went off of that <laughs> when we got back from Hawaii. I thought that's what was decided at that dinner we had. <laughs> That was an internal decision that wasn't <laughs> totally shared. I mean, I just, I was like very on a whim. Like, I think I missed a pill one day and I was just like, oh, I am not going to take it out anymore. And like, that was, it was very on a whim. It wasn't really thought through. And um, I'll link the blog post below about what my experience going off birth control was like, if anyone's interested in that. And uh, I mean, it was around December where I think we both got a little bit of baby fever. Yep. And I was like, I'm definitely going to have a kid. Like, I'm so ready to have a kid. And Eric's all like, obviously, he's been ready to have a kid. And and um, and we started to, like, try. Like, I was tracking my cycle on an app. And, like, the week I was, like, it said, like, you, you're you probably ovulating this week. I was like, we're going to have all this sex that week. Which was awesome sounding <laughs> until the reality until the reality kicked in yeah i mean i have to really like tip my hat to the couples that 
actively try for a long time because that is no easy feat. Um, I know for just that week that we were actively trying, I felt so much anxiety. I didn't enjoy the sex. I felt very mechanical, very robotic. I felt like just this very intense pressure. Yeah, I'll I'll second that. There yeah. was a lot of pressure. And I didn't help the situation by using come on lines like, do you want me to put a baby in you? And especially with somebody that, yeah, I had baby fever, but that was a very new thing. And I did not, I mean, I was still really like hesitant on the fence and, you know, unsure of what having a baby would really mean for my future. And so, yeah, so for the couples that really, really try, like, I can't even imagine the pressure and just all of that yeah, feelings to that you. come with. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a lot of empathy for what I can even imagine, which I'm sure is much more intense. Um, but pretty much after that week, I don't know. I don't even know if we talked about it. It was just kind of like we were getting short with each other. Um, we There was just like a weird unspoken pressure where just the big disconnect felt like it was happening in our relationship. And then... January rolled around and that's when we met with Shaman Durek and when I met with Shaman Durek uh, kids were the last thing on my mind I wanted clarity about my career and I wanted help like healing my relationship with my mom those were like the things I went into my session really hoping to make some strides on and in the middle of like the first 10 minutes of being with him he's reading my energy alchemy and he's just like out of nowhere kids and I'm like um what about them and he's like do you want them I'm like yeah I mean yeah I do you know my whole life people have told me I want I would I'm here to be a mother and I'm going to be a great mother he's like well if you really believe that your purpose was to be a mother like why don't you have kids already you're 28 years old like why don't you have kids at 22 I was like, oh, well, you know, my career and life and da, 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 da. He's like, you don't believe anything you're saying. Like, you're hesitating. You're scratching your neck. Like, you're pretty much just lying to yourself. Here's what's really happening, like, in your system. There's actually a block in your uterus that's preventing you from having kids because you have these two big fears. One of them that you feel like you haven't achieved enough success in your career yet and the other one being this fear of directly impacting another life and the directly impacting another life wasn't surprising to me I've written blog posts about my fears about pregnancy and my fears about having kids and that like because I've had a strained relationship with my mom and she's had a strained relationship with her grandma that I mean I know no child gets through parenting (laughs) unscathed I'm not delusional I know there's no such thing as a perfect parent I know that every parent messes up their kid in some way But because things had been so bad and so intense for so many years between all of us that it was just a lot for me to wrap my head around. Not that I wanted to be perfect, but my mom always said that she wanted to do better than her grandma did. And they would spend years of their lives not talking to each other. And my mom and I had just spent essentially the last six years not talking to each other. And I'm like, you say you want to do better, but you're like, at the end of the day, there's still the same mistakes. And like, you're still recreating this relationship you have with grandma with me. And so... I don't know, making the decision to do better just didn't sound like enough, you know, like, I, right. you know, so anyway, I'm rambling now, but you guys get kind of the idea of what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, the direct impact of another life, totally up there for me. Um, the success in my career, even though like I've probably been kind of talking all around it up to this point in the podcast episode, I had never heard it said so bluntly and point blank to me. Yeah. I mean, you had vocalized to me your fears around what it's going to mean uh, for your your business, your brand, everything when you have a child and so much of the pressure you were putting on yourself um, mentally, emotionally, spiritually uh, in growing your brand at a rapid pace was to prepare for the, a time when you had a child because you thought that you wouldn't be able to balance both. Yeah. I mean, there was the fact of like, when you have a kid, how do you balance having your own business, especially when you work from home? Um, The other big thing too, is like having a kid really does for me, you know, I write about what I know on the blog and 
you know, I had some colorful career history and, and an interesting entrepreneurship journey. And those were like the topics that I quickly got recognized for, even though I, I cover a lot of different topics, career and entrepreneurship were what I kind of became known for, if you will. And the thought of throwing a kid into the mix, it's like, well, I write what I know about and I just don't know if I'm ready to be a quote unquote mommy blogger, not saying that I am going to be a mommy blogger, but I write what I know. So yeah, it's going to be on the blog. Um, and you know, for me, there was this big fear that I didn't understand at the time before I got pregnant, where I would look at so many of these amazing women that I've known. Um, and they just had, they were very like independent, strong in who they were. And then they would have kids and their kid would be like two. And the only thing they'd want to talk to me about is what some random four-year-old at the pool was telling their two-year-old. And they couldn't really carry a conversation like they used to. Like they had yeah. lost themselves in it. Totally. And it wasn't something I really could understand at that point, but I was very afraid of it. Um, I was afraid of that unknown and like what happens internally to somebody when they have a kid that there was just such a big shift in so many of the women that I saw with kids and so the career thing was definitely something I had thought about a lot it was definitely something adding to my resistance but it wasn't something that I had ever heard put so point blank and into this into the physical world that I was like oh shit I kind of do have to really look at that um, even though I've known it and so after the session I told Eric what had happened and we both kind of just agreed, like, yeah, the trying isn't really working for us. We're not going to try. And I think for both of us, we had kind of just for whatever reason gotten in our head that, like, it would be at least a year before we'd have a kid. Yeah, we we totally shifted our mentality back into really appreciating what we have now. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, building careers and building businesses and actually enjoying our freedom sans Tucker. Um, <laughs> Tucker's the dog, for those of you who are listening for the first time. Um, so we were really, we, we got that mental shift going and we were just super cool and excited about just exploring, uh, you know, continuing to work on and explore our marriage and travel and do all of these different things and that the baby would come sometime in the following year. Yeah, I mean, we, I really just did not think, I thought it was going to take a long time to clear those blocks. I didn't think it was anything in the realm of possibility. And I was really okay with that. Like that felt good. Come May, Shaman's staying with us. And a couple of weeks before he started, he was staying with us. I was having a lot of a random suicidal thoughts out of nowhere um not that I was going to act on them that's my mental health counselor said coming out but um I hadn't had them in almost a decade and all of a sudden I was having them and I didn't tell Eric and I was just getting very moody um and Shaman came and stayed with us in his first you know almost week staying with us I was not myself I was very kind of passive aggressive and just like weird about having all these people in my house and he pretty much was like, do you want me to go? And I was like, no, I want you to stay. And we worked through it all. And then he did some really intense healings on me and did um, extracted a spirit, a dense energy that had been with me for a really long time. And I was so tired after that, that I really just thought uh, I was so tired because I was having these suicidal thoughts. I had just talked to that about Eric. To, uh, bleh, I just talked about them with Eric and Shaman. I had all this heavy energy work done on me. Like I just need to go sleep for a week. Yeah, and the only interesting thing that came out of that week was that um, he asked us where we were at with kids again, mm -hmm. and we both said look, look, we're. We're leaving it up to the universe. When, mm -hmm. Whenever the universe sees it fit for us to have a child. That, that, and, he, you know, he was like, oh, that's awesome. And he did say, though, in that moment mm -hmm. that he actually got a vision of me holding a, a baby mm -hmm. and, you know, laughing and 
smiling or something like that yeah so he he got a glimpse of what was coming i guess too yeah and to that kind of point like i think a week before he came and stayed with us one of my friends who gets psychic visions randomly texted me that she had had a dream um that i was pregnant and she thought i was pregnant and i didn't think much of that because for so many years people have always been telling me they think i'm pregnant asking me if i was pregnant saying they had seen a vision of me being pregnant We walked into Reiki Circle earlier this year, and the woman said, like, there's just children all around me, um, and that she did see two children in our future. And so I was just kind of like, okay, whatever. Like, that doesn't change this timeline of, like, a year, um, because I just always – I've heard it so much. Right. And so uh, if you listen to episode 14 and 50 with Shaman Durek, you heard him read my veins where he told me that like my liver wasn't functioning right. And he uh, wanted me to take some milk thistle to like start liver detoxing. And so I was taking milk thistle and then I went and got a colonic. And the day after the colonic, that whole week leading up to the colonic, Eric had thought I was pregnant. I was yep. six weeks late for my period. I was nonstop sleeping. Um, and it just wasn't really myself. Um, or I was like seven weeks late for my period. I don't even know how late it was. Um, and I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. So I went and had the colonic the next day I wake up and I'm like, I, that colonic did not like bring down my bloat at all. Like I, there's something not right at that point when Eric had brought up me being pregnant, I was like, no, I just think I'm late. Cause shaman, um, he probably reset my cycle to cycle with the full moon. Yeah, you're like, if in the next <laughs> four days. When the full moon was in like four days, it's like, if I don't have my period, then I'll take a pregnancy. Right. I'll, I'll just like agree to like make, satisfy you. Yeah. I was convinced that my he had just reset my cycle. And so come, I'm mean, between the suicidal thoughts and all the stress I was under. I really thought I just missed my period because of everything else going on. And he, so after the morning after the cloning, it was two days before the full moon. I was like, Eric, go get the pregnancy test. I think I'm pregnant. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so he goes and gets one of those ones that like, uh, if you're pregnant, two pink lines are supposed to appear in three minutes. And I pee on it. And within like 10 seconds, it was two hot, hot, hot pink lines. Yeah, there there was no maybes. Yeah, there was no maybe. There was no need to take a second test. Yeah, like, what did they come with? Three three uh, sticks that you can use? We didn't need to get past one. No, it was like, oh, okay. So I walk out of the bathroom and I'm like hysterically crying. And I'm like, we're pregnant. <laughs> And so as the receiver of said information, although I, you know, knew that you were pregnant to the receiver when your wife comes out crying and it's not, it's a, and I know her, it was like a mixture of excitement, tears, but also completely freaked out tears. Yeah. I no, you're being generous. I felt excited, but my tears were completely. Right. So as the husband, you don't know how to respond. I mean, I was excited too, but also completely mirrored her fam feelings of being like freaked out. Yeah. No, I did not. My tears were not excitement. I was completely freaked out. I was like, what the fuck is happening? happening right now what the fuck does this mean for my life what does this mean for my future like what is the like what 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 i think i think we said so this is happening (laughs) like like 20 times over like two days like this is real this is happening yeah um yeah it was kind of like yeah the next day i called my doctor i was like i need to come in i'm pregnant and they're like did you take a test i'm like yes i took a test (laughs) um they're like okay well you're due for your annual anyway so we'll just like lump that together I'm like okay cool so I go in and she's like yeah you're pregnant I was like yeah I know (laughs) thanks and at that point we were I guess I was eight weeks pregnant so way further along than missing my period for six weeks I'm not I guess I don't even know um and so yeah my our first doctor's visit I end up with uh, an ultrasound, and we're seeing the dot on the screen. The yolk. And hearing the heartbeat. That was cool. It was cool. I couldn't really enjoy it because all I, I felt like I was watching a movie of my life. Yeah, I get that. I was very weirded out by everything. Yeah, I was sort of just... I, th- I, I was a little detached... Once you heard the heartbeat, you got like excited. I got excited when I heard the heartbeat. Yeah, no. But prior to that, I was a little bit detached. Yeah. 
And so and we were like, okay, well, now there's really, like, I mean, we, there was no question before, but then there was really no question. And so at that point, I was, like, eight weeks pregnant, and I was super happy because that month I was almost out of the first trimester with really minimal um, symptoms, thankfully. I had no morning sickness. Uh, I only got nauseous for, like, a day or two. I refused to read, like, any pregnancy books or read any pregnancy blogs because I was really sad my doctor's like you can read like what to expect when you're expecting I was like honestly I don't want to read anything in the first trimester because I just don't want to manifest any of like the crappy symptoms that come with the first trimester and he's like that's actually a good idea I'm like okay cool yeah and fortunately unknowingly you had already shifted into your new eating style of being primarily plant-based so. yeah I had already been vegetarian for basically more or less since January minus like a couple meals here or there and then we shaman saying with us we were vegan because of the way he eats and it was just kind of communal meals and stuff like that so I I honestly think being vegan the first month and being vegetarian and stuff like that really really helped um because you know there weren't hormones from animal products and there was just a lot everything was very very clean not processed and I felt, I just felt really tired and I was sneezing a lot from all that extra blood production. <laughs> I got woken up a few times. Yeah. And then we got a humidifier. So that was a pretty easy fix. But um, yeah, luckily there was no real crazy symptoms or anything like that. And, you know, the next kind of, my second doctor's appointment wasn't with my typical doctor. It was with another doctor in the practice. And um, we walk into the office and they hand us this financial contract, um, for through delivery. And I freaked out and refused to sign it because we're both entrepreneurs. So you tell us that we, there's a contract. I think that's legally binding and I'm not signing something before I even know. And so for most women, they usually do their birth plan towards the end of pregnancy from what I've, un- I can, I've understood up to this point. Um, and we were pretty much faced with at week almost 11 or 12 being like so you pretty much need to figure out what you want to do if you're not going to deliver with us like you need to switch doctor like obviously we'll keep seeing you because that's like the medically right right to do the way they do it at least they don't get paid until after delivery yeah and so they're like it's not really fair to us it's also just not fair to you because you need to be building trust with your doctor along the way through this like you pretty much need to figure out if you want to do this home birth or if you want, like, what do you want to do? So the next few weeks we found ourselves, um, meeting with a birth center to potentially do a home birth and meeting with a midwife, uh, for, to do a hospital birth. It was just more my style, uh, the midwife. And that was a very interesting learning experience. Um, you know, I was really open to a birth center or home birth until we actually sat down and, you know, we had gone to a meet the doula event, which was really awesome. We are going to hire a doula. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> I know they say the doula is for the woman. <laughs> I'm selfishly excited about the doula because she's going to be my support. Eric goes, what's a doula? I go, you'll thank me later. <laughs> yeah. And I'm already thanking her, although we haven't hired one yet, just after meeting. Yeah, I mean, we are pretty early in this, so we still, we're probably making the decision in like a month. Which, Um, can I, can I insert something? It's going to, not to digress us off topic, mm -hmm. but what we're finding is that we're really early for every (laughs) experience. (laughs) Because of this path that the the OB sent us down of having to figure out our plan so quickly, like we're rolling up. And people are looking like they're ready to pop. And we're like, just normal, you know, Not she's not really showing or anything. So we're, we're early. Well, I mean, no, listen, it's not that it's a bad thing, but I keep feeling like I'm not like supposed to be in these places because I'm not really showing. And I'm just like, am I not supposed to be here yet? And they're like, no, it's honestly a good thing you're here. A lot of people end up switching at 30 weeks. So it's a good thing you're doing it now. Like we do really have our full pick of everything now. So I'm happy everything's playing out the way it is. But yeah, there's definitely the kind of like I walk into situations. I'm like, am I supposed to be here yet? Um, So with the doulas, that was really cool. Um, We did meet two we really like. We'll probably be making the decision the next few weeks. If you don't know, doula basically is really there to support you in the pregnancy. Um, 
there's a couple meetings before you're actually in labor to make sure that you know you guys are all on the same page when you do get to if you choose to deliver in a hospital when you get to the hospital they're really the ones that help advocate that things go as much according to your birth plan and your wishes as possible obviously you know there are protocols in a hospital and if you're at home they really make sure everything's set up how you want it to be set up um when you're in active labor they're helping you get into certain positions that all be best for the baby and for you they're helping add in like pressure points and things like that counter pressure points i think it's what it's called they help with gentle massage throughout it really just kind of like are the anchoring energy if you will of stability and just take a lot of the stress off of the couple i would say yeah totally um and i think like i forget what the stats are but couples that deliver with a doula are less like have fewer interventions and couples that deliver with a midwife have fewer interventions um so it kind of just seemed especially because i do want to have a natural birth i don't want an epidural essentially a doula is just a little bit more expensive than what you're paying for an epidural anyway um, obviously, I know things don't go as planned always, but it just it seems more uh, in line for what I want. Anyway, so mm. we went to the duos and they gave us really good questions. Um, so if you have no idea like what to ask, that was fantastic because they were like, okay, you were thinking about doing a birth center. Make sure you ask about the transfer rate for the place and what hospitals they transferred to. Um, and that was super helpful to know because then when we went with the birth center. Yep. Um, we asked what the transfer rate was and we did not get like a direct percentage answer, um, which I have found fairly common. Like when, um, the typical response is we do everything we can to make sure that there's no intervention. Exactly. So like I said, I met with a different doctor and my my doctor's practice my doctor delivered me i've known him my whole life but i met with the dick he wasn't in one day when we went for the second appointment that pushed us down this path and he was just like i'll do everything in my power to make sure this is a vaginal birth and we didn't at that time we didn't know to ask like well what's your rate well, your c-section rate. right um and so i've i've noticed that what a lot of people will offer up is we do everything in our power to make sure things go exactly how you want it to go but very few will offer up the exact number and less pressed and so when we asked the transfer rate it was kind of just like oh we do everything in our power very very few people are ever transferred once they're in active labor and we're like okay cool and then one of eric's questions were well, what happens if the baby comes out with an umbilical cord wrapped around its head for a home birth which is a fair question and she said oh well if that's going to happen usually we'll we're like we already know that's going to happen before you deliver um the baby's heart rate actually starts to drop and so we would transfer you once we started seeing that happen it's a requirement and that happens in 60 percent of births so by deductive reasoning um at least 60 percent of the people thinking they're getting home births uh are actually getting transferred and that was just like a really big gamble in my opinion like yep. unnecessary chaos at that point um because that's also, just that's only one reason they transferred there's a plethora of other reasons too. absolutely and the and the the only birth house home birth place in in our county they're closest to a hospital that after touring it we just didn't feel that it was the right delivery experience experience for rachel yeah so I, it was actually the hospital I was delivered in. It's the hospital I volunteered at in high school. And while I do love that hospital, um, I really wanted a hospital that I could labor in a tub. I wanted a hospital that provided squat bars and different tools that if you do want to get in different positions during labor, you're not just required to be on your back during it. Um, you know, Especially because I am wanting to have a natural birth. Those were two really important things for me. And um, the hospital that we had originally toured out, uh, they didn't bring up anything with doulas. They didn't bring up, they didn't really allow a lot of these different types of uh, supportive and progressive, supportive and progressive measures. And so, um, so yeah, so we knew we didn't want to deliver at that hospital. We knew the birth center at that point didn't sound like the best situation. And we had met with another midwife that primarily delivers at another hospital and she, when we talked about C-section rates and things like that, could give us numbers right away. It was like 10%, which is way below the national average of like 30, 35%. Um, just really on top of it, fully transparent. Um, and we went to, and I've had a bunch of friends that have delivered with her. They love her. We went to the hospital and 
they were just answering so the thing with the midwife that we're going with in the hospital is they both were answering my questions before like I was even asking them yeah and one of the things I really liked about the midwife that we're choosing to go with versus let's for say the the OB experience was that I didn't feel like I was we were getting pressured or sold yeah. into making a decision. Yeah. She literally gave you the facts and says, I'm here to support you in whatever path you choose. So if you go so far with me and you want to switch, that's great. Yeah. Not not a problem. And um, whereas the, the other experience, I felt like I was really being sold. Like they had to convince me yeah. to work with them or else, right? Yeah, I mean, the cool thing with the midwife we went with, she was like, listen, if you do want to do a home birth, she did a hospital birth and a home birth for her two kids. She's like, I think they're very different experiences. They both have their pros and cons. Um, you know, if you do want to do a home birth, logistically, it take, there's a little bit more stuff that you have to do. So if you want to come here for, like, your prenatal stuff and, like, deliver with them, that's fine with us. Like, it was just very supportive of making sure everything was as easy and smooth as possible. And I had talked to one of my friends who's a doula, and she said um, – who was actually she's actually was pregnant and she said just make sure whatever you do you feel supported by the team that you're going to be working with in this process like above all else and that's what it came down to for us I felt like the hospital had the everything in place for things that were important to me and things that were kind of like fringe benefits if you will like extra additional skin to skin contact with mother and baby like right when the baby's born like they do cord clamping so the baby's not taken away right away um and with the umbilical cord getting cut and the baby getting bathed they let you have as if it's safe if it's safe they let you have skin to skin contact they don't wash the baby for the first 24 hours um just things like that that were more fringe benefits for me they weren't deal breakers but those were things that were more appealing for me about a home birth the hospital allowed and so i just felt like that particular hospital was a nice blend if you will of um just from being super hospitally and then being home birthy obviously there's still protocols and interventions and stuff like that but yeah anyway so that's the long and short of it so if you guys are on, pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant ask about c-section rates ask about transfer rates if you're considering home birth um and just kind of figure out like what are the tools that you really want to feel supported for and i think one thing that we found out after we were sent down this path to explore other options is don't feel like you have to deliver with your OB. Yeah. And, and we were sort of validated in that through this experience by other providers and by other people we spoke to. And they, they say that more times than not, you know, people will get to 34 weeks mm-hmm. and, and then they, you know, have this last minute, like, oh my God, like you're not who I want to deliver my baby. Yeah. And they've stuck, they stayed with them out of feeling uncomfortable about, I don't know, breaking that relationship that they've had for so many years. Well, I think a lot of people don't really think about the birth plan until 30 plus weeks. Yeah. And so we were really forced to think about that at 10, 8, 10 weeks. And that was a big shock. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was definitely interesting. And, you know, what was trippiest about like all of this too was, you know, I if you listen to episodes 19 and 20 of this podcast with Danielle Page, who's an intuitive astrologer, she had, we had, there was, she was, we were actually together for four hours. So those two episodes that you hear are just like a little bit, we were actually together for a lot longer. And what, because I hadn't announced my pregnancy yet, we didn't talk about this, but um, with my sat, this is actually like my Saturn return baby. Is- Your freedom baby <laughs> is the truth of it. Um, so when Saturn was two degrees away from returning to its its position in my natal chart, was actually the month I conceived in April, and then it went retrograde, which you guys, if you listen to the episode, you heard us talking about Saturn retrograding and what that whole thing has felt like for me. And she was like, you were pretty much going to have those suicidal thoughts no matter what, because you have so much stuff retrograding in your chart and all this stuff is happening. But the baby came when it was two degrees away and the month the baby is due, January, is actually when 
Saturn fully returns to its original position and it's like within a week of the projected due date. So uh, this baby and I will be sharing the same Saturn returns throughout our life, which means that we will be having some of the same lessons throughout our life. And um, and I've talked to uh I talked to Danielle about this and then Natalie Miles, who's a psychic medium who will be coming on, I think next week's episode or the week episode after that, in my reading with her, uh, they both kind of said like, this is your freedom, baby. Like yeah. this is, um, you know, for most people it's weird. Cause like babies mean more responsibilities, more restrictions. Like this is your, everyone just keeps saying like, this is your independence, baby. This is your freedom, baby. This is like really kind of breaking through Setting you on a new trajectory. And the trajectory that's supposed to be on. So if, even if you did listen to those episodes 19 and 20, I think it's really interesting to go back and listen to them because we do talk around kids a lot in Danielle's episode. Um, it's super just really, really cool. And I've had, and, you know, especially going in with the initial fears being my career and directly impacting another's life. And then to be like, oh, no, this baby is your freedom, baby, your independence, baby. And now that I am pregnant, you know, I also, in those episodes with Danielle, talked about wanting to shut down the podcast. And if you've been a listener for a while, you know, Eric used to do every other episode with me. Um, And then she sidelined me. (laughs) I didn't (laughs) sideline. Honestly, like, so it became, once I found out I was pregnant, A, I was so, so, so tired that I didn't feel like working. And B, like, the only thing I want, because I do write what I know and talk about what I'm going through it became so I didn't want to have Eric on because I knew I would only want to talk like it was hard enough being on the show with Danielle and other people where I knew I was pregnant and we couldn't talk about it like I couldn't imagine having to record an episode with you and not being able to talk about this big thing in our life like I was getting interviewed to be on other people's podcasts and and they were asking me questions and I so about just gonna be like I'm pregnant <laughs> like um because I felt like my answers just weren't fully like I am just what you see is really what you get with me I don't hide it's tough for you not to be authentic yeah it was so tough for me to not tell people so I didn't really want to do the podcast a because I was so tired b because I felt like this big part of me was missing and for a lot of other reasons I didn't I was kind of thinking about canceling stopping doing it I was having a hard time writing blog content because all of a sudden, it's all I wanted to talk about. Um, again, not that I'm going to only talk about having kids and pregnancy and things like that. You know, much like how I do one career post a week, one other post a week um, in the podcast. I'm sure one episode will be or one post will be pregnancy related. One post will be career entrepreneurship related. Whatever it is, you'll still have a mix of content. But at the end of the day, I always write about what I know. And I finally understand I'm starting to understand that big shift I saw in so many of our friends that had kids where I was like I don't understand how like you lost yourself and I ended up talking to shaman about this afterwards like when I did know I was pregnant I was like I'm still really afraid of losing myself he's like that's not po- like it's not possible for you to not lose yourself like it shows here that you're just going to be insanely hands-on and I was like okay Like, I guess that's what's happening. And I'm just, like, going to fully embrace that, especially after what Danielle said about, like, my life path really being here for family, not so much for work. And um, and seeing how everything unfolds. Yeah. I'm just going to stop resisting it all. That's kind of – I feel like we're just going with the flow right now. (laughs) No, like, we're we're reading and planning. I've I've yet to – by the way, if anyone has any really good dad blogs, feel free to shout them out to me because I'm trying to find them. And it's mostly just like guys like shitting on their kids in a funny way. But then like at the very end of it saying, but I really love them. And I just haven't found many good resources. I'd say the strongest resource I found, and it wasn't really a blog, it was more of an article post, um, which it kind of came back to a conversation we were having this morning which is uh, understanding my the importance for me as a father in the early days is to really understand the true relationship between Rachel and the baby because they've been emotionally, spiritually, and physically connected for nine months um, leading up to the birth yeah. and understanding that that's a special relationship that uh, and re- be respectful of it. Yeah, no, it's true. And... Um 
Yeah, it's if uh, the one thing I've read so far that I really enjoyed reading was the book Spirit Babies, which if you are thinking about having kids, it's more of a book that you should read before you're actually pregnant. Um, Because I was reading it while pregnant. There were things in it that, yeah, we're going to talk about. There's things about the gender, which we're not going to reveal in today's episode, that were very interesting um, that didn't come out until later on in the book that got kind of confusing but that's neither here nor there right now just read the book Stuart Babies (laughs) just the moral of that (laughs) um it's really cool it's essentially uh written by a clairvoyant medium who talks to so it's a concept I've talked about in this podcast before how we all choose our parents and it basically talks about how your future children um, choose you. It talks about miscarriages. It talks about abortion, um, all from this spiritual perspective of these unborn beings. And it's just a really, it's really well written. It almost reads like you're reading a story and I can't recommend it enough. So that's the book I've enjoyed reading, but I'm super curious because I don't feel like I've found any mom blogs that I like. I have certain issues with mom blogs. I don't like that they just like document their journeys with their kids i don't find that entertaining um what would you find entertaining i mean the way i write my stuff not to do my own (laughs) (laughs) no bias here i mean i think you know part of the reason why this episode of the podcast was important to me and writing the blog was important to me like you know when we found out we were pregnant it wasn't like the Instagram photos you see. It was right. like, oh my God, we're so excited. I mean, we are excited. And, we're, and we will have a, a, uh, an Instagram post. Yeah, it went up today. It went up today. With this blog post and this podcast. Everything's going up together. It's going crazy. Oh gosh. But it was important for me to talk about the fact that like my tears when I found out were not happy tears. They were not yeah. excited tears. Um, And so for me, it's that gap between... This is my experience, not like preachy in an educational way. There's so much that we still don't know about this process, but like the helpful tidbits, what I think are helpful tidbits of like ask about transfer rates, ask about C-section rates, see what tools and things like that are available to you in the delivery process. Obviously things don't go as planned, but like if those are things that are going to put your mind at ease and get you comfortable, you know, think about those types of things. Um, so something that's educational and informative, but not in a preachy way and still being really relatable in the sense that like, I have really struggled about like what it means for my brand and my business to have a kid and like how that role, like how all of that unfolds and things like that. It's not easy. And like, if you do go back to work, like there's a lot of things, gosh, it's just like, I think relatability and no, I like it. I like it. Listen, you know, I'll I'll probably be the first to make fun of our own child along with you. But I also I like you heard the example that I was looking for in like a dad blog is, you know, listen, there's enough books and YouTube videos and whatever for me to learn how to change a diaper. I want to learn another thing that was pulled from that which is the importance of me getting dirty with the baby Mm -hmm. because that's where you're going to learn your baby's cues and all those things and it doesn't need to be specific you need to do this and that and this it's more of the um um what's the word I i guess just the acknowledgement of the relationship between myself and baby and myself and you and you and baby and just what that looks like, understanding my true role within the... The, the, the family ecosystem. Th- th- yes. <laughs> Thank you. Pulling out some counseling So if you terms. know cool stuff like that, <laughs> send it over. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all still a learning experience. Like, I was in a conversation with a dad the other day, and he's like, you know, when I come home from work, you know, the mom just hands me the kid, and even though I'm tired from my day, my commute, you know, it's my job to give her that break, and da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, I don't know if it's just, like, a one-size-fits-all answer, and that's why I get hesitant with preachiness, because, like, you know, we actually had to go through that process with Tucker um, in training because Eric would come home and Tucker, the little, his name means to torment, and he's a little tormentor sometimes. And he, I would literally call Eric hysterically crying in the middle of the, the day because Tucker was driving me up a wall so much with his barking and just being needy and all of this type of stuff. And, um, you know, when Eric was coming home for a long while, as soon as he walked in the door, I was like, you just need to take him, like, go out, like, go, just go, as if he was a baby. Mm -hmm. 
and the trainer's like you can't do and the trainer would talk to us a lot she was like you guys want to have kids right and so she basically like got us into like parenting training with Tucker she's like you really can't like you're home all day like you can't just pawn this off on Eric after he's had this commute home and he's had a long day at work like you've had a long day too but you're physically like I'm staying at home like I, nothing's really changing for me other than the fact that like reprieve is walked in whereas Eric has been non-stop and now not only has been non-stop at work he's non-stop in a stressful commute home and then he's non-stop coming into the new energy of the house where it's like give him 30 minutes to decompress and like recalibrate his energy and then you get your reprieve and like not much has changed for me in those 30 minutes it's more of just an extension of my day I can hold on a little bit longer and he's a totally different person when I give him those 30 minutes and Tucker ends up being a totally different person when he gets those 30 minutes and so everyone just ended up doing a lot better and I mean every situation is different like I'm sure there will be days where it's just like I do want to throw a kid at you as soon as you walk in the door but like I just don't think there's hard and fast rules. I just think it's about like learning as you go and being empathetic and understanding and communicative along the way. Drop the mic. Okay. Anyway, we're not even parents yet and we're just talking about parenting stuff, but this is my whole point. Like this was just supposed to be a pregnancy announcement and now I'm talking about conversations I'm having with people that are already parents. Anyway. It gives you real insight (laughs) as to what goes on in our normal communications. Things spiral and spin and... Go all over the place. Anyway, with all of that said, yeah, we're going to be parents come January 2019, and we are excited. Um, let me know if you guys send us an email, rachel at com. Any questions that you guys want to see answered on the podcast or on the blog. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, it would mean so, so much to me if you would subscribe and leave five stars and if you have an extra minute leave a review all that really helps with staying up in the charts and also if you're listening take a screenshot and post it on insta stories and tag me at the confused millennial um that's one of the easiest ways i found to get to connect with you guys because otherwise i don't really know who i'm talking to i'm just kind of talking out into the ether and when you guys actually tag me on insta stories um i can go ahead and like check out who's listening it becomes an easier way for us to start a conversation see if there's any guests or topics that you want covered all that fun stuff um and i love meeting you guys and seeing who's listening so thank you for listening thanks for supporting us thanks for letting me talk (laughs) thank you for supporting us and until next week have a good one love you all